In the previous two sections, we've been discussing rent. Specifically, in the first section, we discussed produce that always affords rent, i.e. food, and in the second section, produce that sometimes does and sometimes doesn't afford rent, i.e. everything else. If you missed it, you can find them here. A very important conclusion that also came out of these chapters is that food, the only produce that affords rent, is also the only good measure for wealth and its progress. To sum it all up quickly, the better the production of food, the more food there is, the more of it there is to exchange for other things like clothes, housing, cars, things like that. This is very easily demonstrated in recent history after large market crashes. People would bring shopping carts full of money to the supermarket because the only thing that they would be willing to trade anything for is food. So as a nation becomes wealthier, there creates a demand for things other than food, right? Because we've established that wealth derives from having an abundance of food. If you have an abundance of food, you're not looking for food, therefore you're looking for other things. People have more disposable income, and so they want to spend their money on art and industry. Therefore, demand for those things rises. And what happens when demand rises? More competition in the marketplace means prices rise as well. We just established that rising prices means that larger quantities of food will be needed to exchange for it. Okay, side note, I'm obviously not talking about the barter system here. In order to simplify the theory, Smith cuts out the concept of uh, exchanging in and out of currency. But as we discussed in chapter four, everything does get exchanged in and out of currency. If you miss that, you can see it here. So if wealth is created by a surplus of food, and wealth creates demand for luxury that is purchased with said surplus of food, then in a wealthy nation there will be a higher demand for materials that produce luxury, such as gold, silver, platinum. And the higher the demand for those materials, the more food will be needed to exchange in order to acquire them. And says Smith, in a growing economy this would always be the case, except that we live in the real world, and particular accidents keep this positive correlation from being absolute. When we talk about markets and their sizes in chapter three, we discuss this idea that supply and demand can affect, affect prices for produce as far as it can physically travel. Smith reinforces that idea here with a freestone quarry. I tried really hard to think of a modern example, but our transportation systems are so advanced that I really couldn't think of a modern counterpart. If you do, please leave it in the comments. So Smith's example, a freestone quarry. The value of a freestone quarry will necessarily increase with the wealth of the place around it. But stone is heavy and hard to move and honestly not that valuable. So it's valuably restricted to the wealth of its particular geographical location. A silver mine on the other hand bears no such limitation. It's valuable in small enough quantities to reach wherever the demand exists. So its market is basically the world. So unless the world at large is advancing in its state of wealth, the value of silver will not necessarily increase with its surrounding neighborhoods or cities. And a single silver mine doesn't supply the entire world. And the chances that as wealth advances, more silver mines will be discovered, especially given their value, very likely. And so Smith concludes that the market for silver is the commercial and civilized world. His words, not mine. Also, that depending on the number of mines and their fertility, supply can change and influence that market in very broad strokes. And here he highlights three possibilities of what would happen to the market for silver in a world where wealth is gradually increasing. If the world is gradually improving and so the demand for silver is steadily rising, but no new mines are found, then the supply doesn't increase. This means that inevitably a given quantity of silver would be able to gradually be exchanged for larger and larger quantities of corn. In simple terms, one silver coin could be worth one ear of corn one day and then over time be worth two ears of corn, meaning the average money price of corn will become cheaper because one ear of corn could be bought with one coin and then half a coin. If, however, a whole bunch of new mines are discovered faster than the rate of improvement of the world, then gradually the metal would become cheaper. This causes the opposite effect of corn becoming more expensive. One coin buys two ears of corn and then it buys one ear. However, if the supply should increase at the same time as the demand, i.e. new mines are discovered roughly in the same proportion as the advancement of the world, then the money price of corn will remain the same despite any improvements. These three eventualities, according to Smith's detail, every possibility of what could happen to prices and nominal value over the course of the improvement of the world. And also what he proceeds to spend the next 71 pages demonstrating in his, throughout his recent history. He considers the four centuries preceding his to be proof for his theory. He narrows his examples down largely to what happened to Great Britain between the 14th and 18th centuries. He also says that they happen roughly in the same order which he detailed, and so he divides his history into three periods. As you can imagine, this analysis is very tedious, but pretty compelling evidence for the natural course of markets, at least in a Eurocentric world. 71 pages later, Smith concludes his first book. But his conclusion takes four pages, so let's hop to it. If you found that analysis helpful and you feel like I've earned it, please subscribe to my channel. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, all that wonderful social media stuff. See you next time.